Good evening, dear friends. Um, tonight we have the pleasure of welcoming a major artistic figure of our times, a theater, opera, and film director, a mentor, a visionary who, apart from her artistic recognition, has been associated with the fight for the fair representation of women in the performing arts in all artistic and technical professions. Philly Lloyd. Philida has spent most, most of her career promoting gen, gender equality on and off stage, and she will share her vision and experience with all of us tonight. Philida, welcome to the Athens Epidaurus Festival once again. I'm, I'm very glad to, to have you with us tonight, and I feel really fortunate to be able to share this stage with you. For this wonderful opportunity, as well as for the honor to invite me to take part to its advisory committee, I would like to thank Rolex and especially Ms. Rebecca Irvin. Thank you very much, head of the Rolex Institute, for this wonderful opportunity. Thank you. I will make just a very, very short introduction for those who are not familiar with all aspects of Philida's work. With Philida's work, you're never bored. From groundbreaking stages of well-known Shakespearean plays with an all-female cast that caused a sensation in London theatres and everywhere in the world, to her innovative approaches of well-known works of opera and musicals, um, Philida has brought her work to wider audiences uh, through her film hits internationally. We all loved Mamma Mia, filmed actually in the Greek islands, but also Philida's next collaboration with Meryl Streep, The Iron Lady, a film about the life and career of Margaret Thatcher. Her all-female fem Shakespearean trilogy was described by London's Observer as one of the most important theatrical events of the past 20 years. In 2018, she directed another major hit, Tina, the Tina Turner musical in London's West End, followed by a celebrated run on Broadway and in Europe. Lloyd's award-winning film Herself premiered at the 2020 Sundance Film Festival to critical praise and has subsequently screened in theatres and at international film festivals. Its themes touch on domestic abuse and one woman's struggle to find safe accommodation. Philida has this unparalleled gift of playfulness mixed with serious, profound thinking said actor and director Fiona Shaw about our guest. Fiona is an old friend of our festival as she has performed in Beckett's Happy Days at the Ancient Theatre of Epidaurus in 2007 and then returned um, for Coleridge's rhyme of the Ancient Mariner staged by Philly Lloyd at the Little Theatre of a Ancient Epidaurus in 2012. As Fiona Shaw underlines, Philida's work, whether it is a film with the carefree backdrop of the Greek islands in the light-hearted music of ABBA, or a classic English play, or again, one of the major hits of the operatic repertoire, is marked by this gift she holds to navigate with ease from the sharp and subtly comical element to the deep world of inner thoughts and unspoken feelings. I would not like to take more time from Philida, but as a theater person, I would like to say just a few words about her unconventional and unconventional Shakespeare approaches, which is the topic of tonight's talk. <clears throat> Donmar, Donmar's Shakespeare trilogy focuses on the representation of women and diverse communities. Harriet Walter, actress with classical training, leads an all-female cast in these three productions of Julius Caesar, Henry IV, and The Tempest, all set in a women's prison. In 2012, Philida Lloyd's production of Julius Caesar at the Donmar depicted the catastrophic consequences of a political leader's extension of powers beyond the remit of the Constitution. With a cast drawn partly from ex-offenders, it stunned audiences on both sides of the Atlantic and posed the question, who owns Shakespeare? Two years later, Walter and Lloyd were reunited in Shakespeare's monumental history play, Henry IV. This performance travels to the heart of family, duty, and country, asking what makes a king, what makes a father. 
The Tempest completed this all-female trilogy in 2016 with its tale of the eternal struggle for freedom, morality, and justice. Each of those actors, notwithstanding whether they had any Shakespearean experience before, was chosen for the instinct for it. And the people who found the most direct route to the meaning often had little formal education, explains Philida in a recent interview asked about her approach in the rehearsals. Everybody understands each other's speeches. We paraphrase the verse and discuss it at length. Then there's a period of exploration where we improvise, so we're not speaking Shakespeare at all, but we're working with a detailed knowledge of what the text means. Um, her work has been really groundbreaking, a real statement with an artistic imprint, imprint, the kind of approach that admirably brought women to the foreground with a grand gesture. But that's not to say that female actors hadn't played a male role before, even in Shakespeare, but Philida did it in a big scale and in such an exquisite way. I would like to thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to uh, have this small speech, and it's my great honor to um, welcome to the stage Philida Lloyd. Thank you very much. Shall I use this one? Yes, okay. Um, I will be juggling my tech here with the, doing my cues for the slides. Um, I am, tell me if I haven't got the mic close enough to my mouth. How's that sound? Um, thank you, Katerina, so much for welcoming me and Rebecca Rolex for the adventure of the last four years. Um, being a mentor for Rolex was um, very particular because of the pandemic, and I, um, yeah, developed a fantastic relationship with my protege, who is going to be performing on Saturday night, Whitney White. I come from the UK, where a debate is raging. I'm sure, like here, we are all furious in the theatre about the lack of government funding in the arts. And there is a suggestion that has been put to us that we need to make a choice between uh, what we might call high art and the funding of professionals and the training of them for that high art on the one hand, and on the other hand, community art, community projects, which often means um, being outside the metropolitan center. And I'm really here to say that these two things, in my mind, cannot, must not, ever be separated. Uh, we have a, an expression in England, the play is the thing. It's taken from Shakespeare's Hamlet. And it's come to sort of mean that the play is the be-all and end-all of everything. And it might be okay to just choose a sexy title of a play and two equally sexy star actors, um, sell some tickets, rehearse them, entertain the audience, uh, good night, and go home. And forgetting, you know, how many people were actually transformed by the experience of making this piece of theater, let alone uh, were the audience transformed, because without one, you're not going to have the other. In 2012, I was given an opportunity uh, to direct, yes, a play, which was Julius Caesar, and it became another play, and then another play, Henry IV, as Katerina has explained, and The Tempest. And it was to become a life-changing mission for all of us involved. And 
it was everything beyond the plays, everything in a way, not but the plays, but everything around them, above them and below them, the um, diverse audiences that we were playing to, the communities that we stepped into and we kind of accumulated along the way, some of whom never actually saw the plays in the theater but were part of our theater community. And this experience, along with the world, which was changing radically um, as we were going through the experience, it changed how I saw my role as a theater director forever. The play was really, the play alone was never going to be the thing again. I've never been brave enough to run a theater or a theater company. Um, I feel being a direct, directing plays or, or operas or films and running a company for me are two really different skills. Some people, I'm sure Katerina is one, is running this, this massive festival, who can do both. Um, and maybe we could pick up that theme later about whether the more powerful gesture um, in the arts, is it going to be made from within the institution when you've got your hands on the reins of power? Or is it going to come from outside the institution where maybe you're trying to Trojan horse your way in um, with something new? So over the last uh, 35 years, I have thus been a freelance director directing plays and operas and films. And when people come together to make art in a group, it's an opportunity always to try to remodel the world as you would like it to be. So over the years, I've made hundreds of attempts at my perfect world. I tried to say uh, yes to stories that put women at the center and say no to ones who, that didn't. I tried to um, bring diversity uh, to the theater where there wasn't much. Often my dreams were undermined by the context in which I found myself. Uh, let's talk about opera for a moment, um, where you know, the restrictions of the repertoire, it's very hard to get uh, in, in the kind of, in the repertoire beyond um, a, a story of a woman dying for the love of a man. Um, and trying to bring diversity into uh, opera, in the UK at least, where orchestras, choruses, and stages of singers are um, almost entirely white uh, still. Um, and because of the restrictions of, of the music, where, you know, somebody asks you, would you like to direct, uh, would you consider doing Verdi's Otello? Uh, you can't really go to them and say, well, I would like to do that, but what about if Otello was sung by a woman? How do you make that work with the music? And there have been people who've been brave enough to try such experiments. So I directed then a Hollywood film, and I was lucky to have the greatest experience of my life wrecking that film in a really shaky little helicopter that took off from Sunion, I think, and took me all over the Greek islands. And I started off absolutely terrified of helicopters. And after one day, I was kind of, let's go once again round Dimitri and go in low, you know, we're landing here. And I then spent, yeah, an incredible month on uh, Skopelos and Skiathos. But the other three months of making that film, despite it being directed, produced, and written by women, um, was at the James Bond studio in Pinewood in the UK, where there were literally hundreds of men on the studio floor, and you only really saw women in costume and makeup. Now, I was asked to direct a film for the BBC of Shakespeare's Henry V. And when I suggested Henry V be played by a woman, the producers actually thought I was joking. And I had to tell them I wasn't. So my efforts to make change, occasionally they might have been effective in the moment, but they really did lack continuity. I don't think I felt impeded by being a woman. 
uh, I think, um, I think though, like a lot of women of my generation, I felt uh, too grateful to be in continual employment at that time. So, back to 2012, when, for the first time in British theatre history, two women got their hands on the keys of one of the so-called important London theatres, Josie Rourke and Kate Pakenham. And they asked me to direct a play in their opening season. And it coincided with a report had just been published saying that for every woman that was working in British theatre, there were two men. I'm not sure this has changed, and I'd be really interested to know what the statistics are here. But something at that moment just snapped in me, and I thought that women had to not just be center stage in this production, it had to be a complete takeover. We were gonna grab the crown jewels of our culture, and we were gonna run with it. And this was Shakespeare, but what play was I gonna choose? And I'm now paraphrasing um, Peter Brook when I say that plays are something like planets. They move closer, they appear to move closer to the earth in a kind of rotation. Um, Julius Caesar is a play about the assassination of a dictator. It begins with a horrifying uh, blow for freedom and then descends into dreadful civil war. And in the, the two years leading up to my making this choice of play, there were dictators falling all over North Africa, in Egypt, Tunisia, Libya. There was the promise of emerging democracy there, but after the, after the revolution was coming the chaos. So with some apprehension, but sort of certain that it would, um, this play would speak of the world in which we were living, I suggested um, an all-female production of Julius Caesar. Now, Julius Caesar, I'm sure you know this play, um, or you, you think you do, or I thought I did. Um, it it's probably lives in, in Greek culture a little bit like one of your 5th century um, BC great tragedies. It's probably on, it's on our cur school curriculum. And most boys and even girls know some of the famous lines and bits of the speeches, you know, friends, Romans, countrymen, lend me your ears. It would usually be performed in the UK by white men who've mainly been to the same universities and even the same schools. Um, it, I, it, I didn't like every part of it, but it does have some of the greatest scenes for actors. And so I spent um, many months uh, cutting the play. I think I cut about a third of it. And I created some doubling so that those two actresses who would be playing women in it were also playing men. So there were 12 women who were going to be suddenly bounced onto the political, into the political arena. Now, um, getting out my gadget here, um, asking one of the greatest classical actresses in the UK to play Brutus, the best part, um, could have been a kind of impediment to the rehearsal process because it could have created a hierarchy. Um, but it didn't because I chose, pressing my tech, oh, here we go. Um, I chose, here she is, Harriet Walter. Um, she was 62, and we had just recently worked together on a fabulous play, um, if any of you get your hands on it, um, by Schiller called Mary Stuart, in which she played Elizabeth I. And she had just, when we started talking about this, she had just played uh, Cleopatra, there she is, as Cleopatra at the Royal Shakespeare Company. And she'd really kind of run out of road on the classical stage. There weren't really any women's parts for her left to play. She said, incidentally, that she thought she had more in common 
with Brutus and Julius Caesar much more than she ever had with Cleopatra. But what was crucial about Harriet was it wasn't just that she was the most incredible speaker of verse and made you think she was just making it up as she spoke it. But, and she could help me teach the less experienced actresses in the rehearsal room you know, how to do it. But she was a feminist, a socialist, and an activist. And she believed that every single person in that room's voice was as important as hers. So we needed to find a context for this production. And I couldn't really see Harriet in Roman armor. And nor did I want to set the play in a modern, you know, put Harriet in four inch heels and set this in some modern corporate world and watch her slaughter her boss. I had a, um, a hunch that a context for the play might be a woman's prison. So Harriet and I went to Holloway Prison in London and worked with a group of women to see whether the play spoke to them. And after a series of extremely chaotic workshops, um, they came to us and said that they decided that the play was, I quote, highly suitable um, because they felt that their obsessions with freedom and justice were just like those of the characters. So I believe that how you make, how you make theater, how you make any work of art, how you do it, can be as life-changing and is as important as the work you make. And so the choice of who else was coming in the room with Harriet was going to be absolutely critical for this venture. So, um, here we have, this is Jen Joseph, who was in the company right from the beginning. Now, Jen is an ex-offender. She had spent uh, time in prison, and where she discovered theatre and believed that it had literally saved her life. And it was Jen who helped us build a, a kind of authentic prison world. And then there was Karen. She was from Glasgow. She was actually a comedian. Um, and she brought to us her experience of addiction. And here we have, this is Irene, who at this very moment, Irene Ketakidi, she's Greek. She's an hour down the road giving electric guitar lessons. She is literally one of the greatest electric guitarists in Europe. And so if any of you ever want to learn electric guitar, I can give you her details later. Um, and with Irene and Carolina here, who was from Spain, neither Irene nor Carolina had English as their first language. But it was them that brought us the stories from Spain and Greece of the escalating economic collapse and social unrest. Then there was Martina, and she spoke to us of revolution in her childhood in the Caribbean. And she was to play Cassius, who says to Brutus at a crucial moment in the play, think of the world. Well, we literally felt we had the world in the room. And at that time, we took it completely for granted that we could travel in and out of each other's countries. We took cultural exchange very much for granted. The most important thing I asked for of my bosses and anyone here who works in the theater will know what I'm talking about was time. I asked for lots of rehearsal time. I asked for it, I got it, and I really did uh, use it. And the rehearsal process, which um, Katerina's uh, mentioned, was on the one hand, very forensic. Um, yes, a lot of very close analysis of the text. We used actions and objectives, which those of you who are directors will understand what I'm talking about, analyzing every sentence. And yes, we found that our less experienced um, members 
they somehow had often a completely direct understanding of Shakespeare's more obscure passages. And we began to understand that knowledge was coming to us in very different, from very different directions. And then the other half of the time was very chaotic and improvisational and experimental. I had lots of ideas that I wanted to try and break open the play in particular ways. And we had a brilliant movement director, Anne Yee, who was from America, where Donald Trump had just announced that he wasn't quite ready to challenge Barack Obama for the presidency. So I asked all the actresses to create prison characters. Um, I wanted them to have created an identity for themselves. That person was performing Brutus Cassius Casca and asked them to think about in what way the prison character they created was mirroring the characters they were playing. And Harriet began Googling political prisoner, English speaking woman and came across Judy Clark. Now, Judy Clark had been uh, arrested in 1981 for her role as the getaway driver in a political robbery in upstate New York in which two policemen and a security guard were killed. Um, by the time we came to, by, the, by 2012, she was 63, she'd been in prison for 31 years, and she was unlikely to ever see freedom. Now, because we were in the rehearsal room, we were, and I'm going to try and say a Greek word here, apomonomenai. Does that make sense? We were apomonomenai, from men. We were sequestered like nuns. Um, freedom to speak was everything to us. And even Harriet would tell the cast that when she was playing leading roles, leading roles, she only felt entitled to take up a small corner, not a small corner, a small portion of the conversation in the rehearsal room. And other people talked about how they always worried about what they looked like when they arrived at rehearsal. And they began to stop caring. Um, and the first thing, we, well, we started to get into men's shoes. And we started noticing how men took up the space at home, on the, in the workplace, on the subway. We noticed how men didn't move their hands very much. They didn't move their hands when they spoke to modify the conversation. They didn't also open their fingers very much. So we decided that only Calpurnia and Portia would be allowed to use their hands in that way. The rest of us just kept our hands on the whole by our sides. We also noticed how men didn't sort of stand obliquely like this when they talk to you. So they, they were four square on the whole and their hands were still. And so we, we didn't try to be men. We just stopped doing all the things that would remind the audience that we were women, if that makes sense. We just tried to remove those signals, those gestures. And we actresses began to really enjoy filling the space. We were kind of man-spreading all over the room. It was quite fun. Um, and one actress came into work one morning, and she said she had been walking on the pavement on the sidewalk on her way to the rehearsal, and a man was coming towards her, and she just thought, I know what, I'm going to experiment. I'm not going to get out of the way and see what happens. And they ended up crashing into each other. So sure was this guy that she was going to yield so what else was different? In what way was this transformational for Harriet, say, who had, you know, so much experience on the classical stage? What was different for her? Well, the argument. She had the argument. She had the big speeches. Okay, she played Cleopatra. She has big speeches, but they're all, almost all about her love for Antony, not about her politics, which God knows she had. 
um, why did he leave that out? But here, so Harriet's argument was to murder or not to murder Julius Caesar, to bring down the world or not. Other actresses welcomed not having to hide their accents. Um, I didn't want anything to come between them and the text. I didn't want them to have to put on special, what we call BBC English, um, to make you believe that these people were um, people of status. So many of these women had literally lived the size, lives the size of Shakespeare's. They'd experienced gigantic loss, betrayal, imprisonment, etc. But they'd never had a chance to act those lives that size. I wanted each of them to know that they didn't have to become a millimeter less than themselves to own a place on the stage. I felt, actually, a lot of fear. I was fearful about, could we release the heart of the play? Um, would the audience hear us? But fear, for me, has always been an important part of the process, an essential part. If it's not there, then it's probably not worth doing. And when we first heard Carolina from Spain in the rehearsal room go into the middle of the room and after the murder of Caesar, she called out, liberty, freedom, tyranny is dead. And we felt there was an electric atmosphere. It was as if how many women have ever got to say those words on stage. We felt fear, but the much bigger feeling was the freedom. So we were all, we felt we were on a journey, we were all changing, but how to make the transformation in the theater for the audience? Well, when this group first walked onto the stage, they looked, here they are in their prison uniform, they looked as far away from certainly a UK audience idea of majesty, nobility, and power, as you could imagine. They are the wrong gender. They're the wrong color. And as soon as they opened their mouths, most of them, you could tell they were the wrong class. Now, I don't know whether that's the same in Greece. Can you tell what social class people come from, from the way they speak? Well, to some extent you can in the UK. And they didn't look Shakespearean at all. They looked like some kind of refugees from our culture. And yet, and yet, and of course this was the trick. I remember one night I was sitting in a group of corporate sponsors, men in suits and women in very flashy heels, and I was apprehensive as the girls came onto the stage and I could feel this tension in the room from these people around me. They were looking at the girls and there was a feeling of, you stay right where you are, right there. How the hell have you been given these crown jewels of our culture to play with? But on the other hand, there was a feeling of, you do look as if you might have the capacity for murder. And this play really needs that. So that was the upside. Um, the theater we, we performed in was in the round it was actually more like a kind of caged basketball court. And the audience were kind of almost trapped in the space, in this, in this sort of basketball court arena. And I feel this being in the round, for me, is where you make community with an audience. I mean, we're a community here, but if any of you, you're not going to cry. I'm not going to make you cry, but were you to cry, you could definitely get out of here without being spotted by any of your neighbors. In the round where we can all see each other, especially you bring a woman, group of women, as we did in America, a woman shackled into the space. And the tension in the audience, almost embarrassment, I would say. And the audience, of course, were participating in this. At first, they were eavesdroppers on this terrifying conspiracy 
that was occurring. They were implicated. And then when we came to the moment of murdering Caesar, we asked one of the audience to vacate their seat because Caesar needed it. And the audience became the Senate and Caesar was slaughtered in the middle of them. And that's the girls, the prisoners told us that um, that's how they'd murder someone in prison. They'd shove a load of bleach down their throat. There were all kinds of methods. We had boiling, we started with boiling kettle, um, throw a boiling kettle in somebody's face, but that got sort of, everybody was just soaked for the rest of the evening. So we, we went, with the, went with the bleach in the end. And the audience said that they heard new words. People who knew the play really well heard new words, new phrases. Um, they, when the characters, they decried each other for being womanish, for example, that was an, an obvious one, but it was like hearing a very familiar music score played on different instruments. It was like the same, but different. And of course the play had been written for one gender to perform men. But seeing it performed with one gender, there was no doubt that the arguments of the play became really, really clear. There's a great scene in which Caesar's wife, Calpurnia, has a premonition that he must not go to the capital on the Ides of March, on the 15th of March, because he's going to die. And she spends quite a long scene trying to persuade him, don't go because you're going to die. And eventually, after a lot of work, he accedes to her demand. And next thing you know, his, one of his bloke cronies walks in. And within minutes, this, this man has totally flattered Caesar into changing his mind. And off he goes to the capital to his death. And seeing the person playing the woman kneeling on the ground, being actually given a bit of a buffeting by Caesar, he was so annoyed with her at the end of the scene. Um, the, the kind of arguments of the play just were, became blindingly clear. And of course, Shakespeare's use of the voicelessness of women, which we were to um, discover in the other plays we were doing, w was, was really clear. So seeing the most, let's call them among the most voiceless, adults in our society, women prisoners, seeing them take up this amount of cultural space for an audience made young people in particular, and young people were who we were really trying to speak to, made them, it, it changed what they thought was permissible to them, not just on stage, but in life itself. One 14-year-old Bangladeshi Muslim girl who was so voiceless that her teachers had never heard her speak aloud in class. She came to a workshop for three days at the Donmar and saw the play. And at the end of this three-day period, she walked out onto the Donmar stage. She opened her arms and she said in a in a commanding voice, I am the Prime Minister. And we were asking the audience to have extreme faith in us. I mean, we were trying to rivet them with our speaking and persuade them to, with their faith, to make up for our shortcomings. Because sometimes we were ludicrous casting for the parts we were playing. But in other moments, it was as if you literally saw Brutus in front of you. And the production was full of disturbances, by which I mean you never quite knew whether you were going to get through a scene. And we would have moments where uh, somebody would be injured during a fight scene and the guards would come rushing in and stop the show and the audience would have to wait while the actor was, was cleaned up. Or at the end of the play, in order to highlight the powerlessness of the women. 
We stopped the show one minute before the end. It was as if, oh, because you had all your shenanigans with the fight scene when you had to stop the show, the guards were like, you've overrun time, stop, goodbye, good night. So the sort of glorious climax, which was going to come with music and everything else, suddenly, bang, no, lights up, and it's the end. So what of the wider world? Because women had played, you know, Shakespearean leads before. Katerina mentioned uh, Fiona had played... Fiona Shaw played Richard II at the National. Catherine Hunter played King Lear. Julie Taymor, who's here, whose amazing film that came out in 2010 of The Tempest. Helen Mirren had played Prospero. So, so what, what was going on? What, what was the response to us? Well, the first thing that happened was that certain male critics wrote quite violently, actually, against the production. And... One man wrote, um, called me, uh, quote, a tyrant greater than great Caesar himself, which when I look at it now, I feel it's almost a bit of a compliment, but at the time, it really didn't feel like that. And my bosses at the Donmar, far from shrinking back and thinking, right, enough of that, let's move back to private lives or, you know, something a bit more jolly, they immediately asked me to do two more productions and planned to tour Caesar to New York. And I was greatly supported by them. I was greatly supported in their thinking that this was not just a play. They wanted to support a kind of expanding conversation. They wanted to invest heavily in education work. Not sort of the education department being somewhere over there doing a few workshops in the community, whatever, but actually, this was to be center to the whole mission. When we went to New York, we took our education department with us. We were all committed, all part of it, all invested. And when we went to New York, we were suddenly, for the first time, free of the British class system and these, the patriarchy of the British critics who were all highly educated white men. And we got support from local audiences in Brooklyn. We had eminent female film stars coming to see us and the New York Times were very complimentary and we had kids from Brooklyn come to see the play who had never seen a play before, let alone a Shakespeare, and get like really revved up and excited by it. And we felt a new freedom and confidence and the girls began to spread their wings into the city, into New York. My God, did they. Um, one night in the bar at St. Anne's Warehouse after the show, Harriet had a long-lost cousin who turned up to see Julius Caesar. And she was telling him about this prison character that she had based her character of Brutus on. She was telling him, about Judy Clark. And suddenly, the cousin's wife stepped forward and said, would you like to meet Judy? And Harriet said, w would I what? And she said, would you like to meet Judy? Because I'm a psychologist and I work with Judy at Bedford Hills Penitentiary in upstate New York. We run the mother and baby unit together. So, Two weeks later, Harriet and I were sitting in the visitor's center of, this is, that St. Anne's in New York. Um, we were sitting opposite Judy Clark in her green prison jumpsuit. And Judy, by her own admission, had transformed from angry revolutionary via a period of two years in solitary confinement and several lifetimes of education in philosophy, religion, the study of Hebrew. She had evolved into this calm, wise, and yes, highly educated person. And she told us that for some years, there had been a small group of people who had been campaigning for her release um, but the idea, you know, it was scheduled that she would not be released until she was 107. So 
in, in other words, she was never going to be released. Um, 75 years to life. So she told us about this campaign, and we and the rest of the actors, we immediately signed up to the campaign. So what had become this aesthetic solution to set the play in a prison was now a mission to give voice to women victims of the criminal justice system. And we found a prison uh, in the north of England um, which were to become a new kind of community partner for us. And we made a profound connection with one prison officer, a female officer, and a drama therapist who was working continually in the prison. And they helped us to explore our second play, which was another bastion of British male culture and boys' school, Henry IV, which is a story about a young man caught between two kinds of parent, the stern patriarch and the much more indulgent uh, parent. And we explored it through the lens of addiction, which um, was what we were, we were coming to know, understand was so prevalent in prison, and also of the uncertainty of the land under our feet. Um, because every time we went in to do a workshop, we'd think we, we were safe in the room, and suddenly the door would crash open, in would come guards, grab half the women, take them off to court, or another half would be removed for their meds. We were, we were constantly like, are we going to be here? Will we still be here at the end of the next 45 minutes? And so this sense of the land being up for grabs and anybody could take it, which is very much what the, what the play was about. And it wasn't like we were going in being experts on Shakespeare and, you know, bringing this Shakespeare to the masses behind bars. They were... They were teaching us, they were showing us how to think. And we stepped into a space that is really not often allowed to women on the classical stage. We were rudely and raucously funny. And that's uh, Sophie Stanton playing Falstaff in her English football insignia, her merchandise. Um, with Martina um, at, at the climax of Henry IV. And a very enlightened prison governor of this prison in Yorkshire took a risk and allowed us a telephone line. Every Tuesday night, we had a telephone line from London into this prison in Yorkshire, where there were a group of women in prison who were sitting around this conference call. And they weren't just like eavesdropping on us. They were kind of challenging us and commenting. And they had the scene in front of them. And they'd say, well, it's obvious why the king, you know, has lost his mind and is trying to wage war. You know, he's, he's ashamed. He's feeling shame. And shame converts into violence. So... We weren't just performing in prisons and schools. They were, weren't just performing there. They were our community and our collaborators. And we returned to New York for the second time. This time, we were fully committed to the campaign to free Judy Clark. And we started taking part in forums at St. Anne's in Brooklyn with prison governors, ex-prison governors, ex-offenders, African-American women victims of the prison industrial complex who had been incarcerated with Judy Clark. And we wrote letters trying to raise outrage at the severity of the US parole system. And we went back to talk to Judy, not just about this dream of her freedom, but about our third play. Now, The Tempest, is a play about somebody incarcerated, really, or abandoned on an island. A person who has to come to terms with forgiving their enemies who put them on the island. It's about a parent struggling to let go of a child. 
about someone who, through very deep and esoteric studies of the deepest kind, has evolved into a very particular human being. Somebody a little bit like Judy Clark, who, when she was arrested in 1981, she left a one-year-old daughter, who happened to be called Harriet, on the outside. And they had only ever seen one another in prison. In 2016, we had absolutely no idea of what was coming on both sides of the Atlantic when we came to Mount the Tempest. On our way to a workshop in prison, we heard on the news that the UK had voted to leave the European Union. We were crying on the train as we went up there. But when we got to prison, the women were like, oh, you know, get over yourselves. We're much more, let's get on with the workshop. You know, give us the Shakespeare. You know, they, they understood what it felt like to be abandoned on an island. And we were going to have to learn what that felt like. <laughs> we thought that we were now kind of exploding out of the Donmar Theatre. And we wanted to present all three productions together. And so Kate, our producer, and her staff they raised a million pounds to build us a giant tent at King's Cross Station in the middle of London where we would perform all three of the plays in the, every Saturday we did all three plays together and we would make these films of them. And I think it was possible to raise this kind of money for such a, um, such a project partly because of our social mission and education work, because that was so central. It made it perhaps slightly easier um, to get that kind of money behind us. So on Saturdays, Harriet was to play for breakfast. She would play Brutus in Julius Caesar. Then for her afternoon, she played Henry IV. And then in the evening, she played Prospero, which is one young boy friend of mine said, well, I mean, not even a man has done that before. Um, we didn't think they had. We had, um, on November the 9th, we were performing a school's performance for young people. And we gave away, incidentally, 25% of our tickets free to anybody between the age of um, 18 and 25. And on that day, November the 9th, we'd heard the news that Donald Trump had been er elected um, as president of the United States. Uh, the whole company of women were beside themselves. And when at the end of the performance, the guards stepped in to stop the show, as they always did one minute early, Harriet was the only person left on stage. She was a, the last one to be frog-marched back to her cell. And she, she started to walk. She suddenly stopped, turned to the audience, and she just cried out in this anguished voice, the world is going to hell. It's been taken over by tyrants. We can't do anything in here. You do something. And 400 teenagers literally jumped to their feet and just were roaring their cheers and support for her. They were, they were part of something. They felt activated by this group of imaginary female prisoners. So we went back to Washington at the beginning of 2017. We marched, sorry, we went back to New York. We marched in Washington in protest at Donald Trump's inauguration. And then we had some news that Andrew Cuomo, who was the governor of New York, had been to Bedford Hills Penitentiary to visit Judy Clark and to assess what he felt had or had not been her transformation. And he had recommended her to be considered for parole. Three months later, it would be turned down. So there were all these contortions in the world and we had all changed. We had, we had found freedom 
and we had found the strength of community making us vow that we would always speak up and we would never be satisfied with just a corner of the creative space. And by 2017, it was actually in the UK becoming quite common for women to be taking um, male roles on the classical stage and for there to be all-female productions. So what are the individuals in the company? What were, what were their transformations? So um, Katerina mentioned um, Claire, who, this is Claire Dunn, who played Prince Hal and Portia. And she was, she was influenced very much by the domestic violence that we, the stories of domestic violence that we heard from women in prison. And she was also, frankly, really pissed off with the lack of opportunity she was getting on screen. And she couldn't get hired to work on screen. So she decided to write herself a feature film about a woman escaping domestic violence and who builds a house with her own hands that's called herself. And I was lucky enough to direct that film. And I also went on to work with Kush Jumbo. There she is as Mark Antony. And she had always thought that she'd only used half her muscles you know, on stage, half her energy or even a quarter. So she decided to write herself. She wanted to write a play in which she got to do everything she'd ever wanted to do on stage. And she wrote herself a play that I directed about Josephine Baker. And we took it to America, and Kush became a TV star in America, and she now has her own production company. This is Jackie. She was away from her four children for the first time in America with us. She thought, sod this. She sat down and started writing a novel and got it published. And then there was Jade. She became a writer and wrote herself a play about falling in love with a woman for the first time. And that play was produced in London and New York. Harriet wrote a memoir. And she suddenly became a TV star. Again, she'd only ever played, she sort of said, kind of, yeah, kind of slightly thankless bit parts on television. For any of you who've watched Succession, or I don't know whether you have the series Ted Lasso here. Um, it's about football. And you'll, if, if you've seen Succession or Ted Lasso, you will know what kind of fun Harriet is having with her life. And she, incidentally, she reflected that she'd spent all this time focusing on the experience of being a man on stage. That by the time she came to play Prospero, she felt neither man nor woman, but pure human. During the global pandemic, we lost our freedom and the community of being able to be in a room together. The show did not go on. And many people left the theater profession, especially women. And when we came back after the pandemic, there were all kinds of questions about who is inside and who is outside the castle, who's in the institution and who's outside. And the play alone could really never be the thing again. We now really do have to think of the world. And it shouldn't be possible to have to think about high art on the one hand and community on the other. These things cannot be separated. And our project has no end. We're still working with the women in prison. We're still a community held together by our mission and our way of working. And we're talking about what our next project might be. Next week, I start rehearsals on a verbatim play about the causes of the Grenfell Tower fire, which some of you may have read about. It happened in the UK um, six years ago in which 72 people died in a tower block. Um, it's a story of 
unheard voices, and it's about the failure of our government to prevent um, profit being more important than people. And I'm again outside the institution of the National Theatre. I'm trying to use the project, yes, as a Trojan horse to get different kinds of people through the door, to get some wider access for people who, to our culture, for people who, who, who don't have it. And I'm doing what I have never done before, co-directing. That's an oxymoron. Um, and I'm doing it with someone much younger than myself. And this is a, an attempt, I guess, at transformation, an attempt at um, surrendering some kind of power. It's going to be a challenge. I'm very full of fear, but I hope it's the right kind of fear. So I'm going to celebrate the um, five years I spent on the Donmar trilogy and to give myself courage and you courage, those of you working in the theatre, to keep looking for freedom and building community through your work. And I'm going to read an email from one of the company members, um, Charlie Josephine, um, there she is in the first performance of Julius Caesar. And Charlie's transformation was among the most profound of all of us. And she wrote to me and said, Julius Caesar was my first professional acting job out of drama school. So it was a brilliant boost to the start of my career. But also, looking back, I can see how Julius Caesar was part of this slow, sticky and joyous personal evolution that is still unfolding. Being in an all-female production surrounded by such powerful women felt empowering. It was also jarring for me for reasons that only made sense years later now that I understand that I am trans. At the heart of our production there was always this throbbing energy, this raw fight, this fuck war cry. There was a fight to take up space, a fight to speak words denied to us, a fight to tell the truth, and a fight for love. All things that I'm still fighting for now. I hope that's useful, and I hope Athens is lovely. It is. Thank you. Okay, I'm just going to add one postscript. Um, in May 2019, after a second parole hearing, Judy Clark was set free. We weren't responsible for that, but we like to think that somehow our faith that one day she would be did play a part. Um, here she is. Um, sandwiched between Harriet, her daughter, and me. That's, we were at um, a performance of the Tina Turner musical I did in New York. And this is Judy's first trip to the theater for 38 years. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, dear all, it is not only a great honor, but also a great pleasure having Mrs. Philida Lloyd among us. The Don Mar trilogy uh, was doubtless a novelty. It was a great contribution to the contemporary Western interpretation of Shakespeare. The three forceful and energetic productions with an all-female cast evaluated Shakespeare's world from the female perspective. This project marked a significant moment for the British theatre as a political act, as an act of inclusion, and most importantly, as a social mission. So now it's time to have a small talk, a conversation with Mrs. Philida Lloyd on how do an artist grows, commits, experiments, succeeds, or even fails. Uh, Philida, do you want to... Um, uh, 
go the, ta the trailer of Donmar uh, to start with that before the Q&A? Because we didn't have that. Yes, we yeah. did not. Okay. man whom I've often noted in my company, but I know not his name. Oh, <laughs> as Caesar loved me, I weep for him. But as he was ambitious, I slew him. Admired Miranda, indeed the top of admiration. Oh, Uneasy lies the head that wears a crown. No, Blowman! I let the, the gods of war! Slap my ass and call me man! So, uh, I heard you before saying that uh, you're not uh, feeling brave enough to run a theater, but I cannot imagine a braver person than a political artist. And I was wondering if you consider yourself as a political director. Yes, I think so. I think it just, as soon as you start, um, every choice you make is a, is a political choice, isn't it? In one direction or the other, so yes, definitely. Uh, you chose three of the most political uh, Shakespeare strategies, uh, which were set in uh, women prison. And uh, I was wondering, do you consider, um, no, it's not, uh, do you recall any of these experiences right now? Do I recall them? Yes. Um, yes, because as I say, we're part of the community we're, we're still, the group of us is still working together mm -hmm. in different combinations. Um, and we're still working in prison with our colleagues. So we're still, we're trying not to be nostalgic about it because we're moving on. But um, I think we get strength from thinking about what we did and what we went through, yes. Did you want to readdress Shakespeare in a way because Shakespeare excludes women from the narrative of our culture. Yeah, I mean, I think that, I don't know about here, but um, in many ways, British productions of Shakespeare were among the most conservative in the world because they're in the original language. As soon as you put them into translation, you're already on a, on a journey, a huge journey. But somehow our obsession with um, yes, the words, the language. And um, what we forget is that these plays were written to be done in modern dress, in the costume of the audience. And since about 1900 in England, we started doing them in period costume. So up until 1900, when you look at for example, 18th century pictures of Shakespeare productions, they're wearing 18th century costumes. So they might be playing Julius Caesar, but they're dressed like us. And so we got into this, I think in the UK, this kind of heritage, this is before we even get to gender. We got into this sort of heritage industry with Shakespeare, mm -hmm. forgetting the kind of political um, point of these, that they were... They were plays written in a kind of virtual police state, speaking in metaphor to the audience about politics, highly political and very modern. Um, so it was partly, yes, gender was, gender was the center of it, but it was also about class and 
very much about class too, who had, who was controlling the reins of this heritage industry. Mm -hmm. uh, of course, all these plays have a social meaning and uh, you, you pointed out that they are also um, plays that it, uh, puts out injustice in prison system and also that they create, um, how can I say, um, the, the, the thing that we make prisons, little prisons for ourselves. So in modern times, in our days, do you believe that uh, we, we experience lack of freedom? Well, at the moment, I think as we arrive at Athens airport and are told to go others over there, we're having a profound feeling of that. I mean, we're getting a real taste of, you know, we thought we ruled the world, we thought we were an empire, and now we're literally, um, we've painted ourselves into a terrible corner from which I will be dead before we, we get out of that. One day, maybe we'll be accepted back into Europe. But um, I think that is the biggest existential um, mm -hmm. event that, you know, I've spoken of the way in which The Tempest, the tempest is, is about, you know, that, that prison of an island. And in The Tempest, it's also about the freedom of the island, the imagination. But politically, you know, we're in a bad, we're in a bad place. Your, the range of your work is broad. Wherever I look, I see women. You put women center stage. Is this a precondition for your work? Definitely. I mean, I think we all, don't we? Whether, who, wh whatever, whoever we are in the world, we're going to curate and cast in our own image. Um, we just are going to see the world. It's just as natural as breathing. Um, to do that, so it is a precondition, yes. Uh, so, uh, do you agree w by being labeled as a female director? Do you have a feministic ag agenda, maybe? Um, definitely a feminist agenda. I mean, I, yeah, I hope I'm more of a, just a director now. <laughs> I think so, um, but, um, and I don't mind being called a woman director at all. I'm, it's okay, um, but I think as a director, one wants to be in that non-binary space, very much so in the role. I think it's helpful actually um, to go to that place that Harriet describes of just human in the space. Um, but yes, I always try to find jobs for the girls <laughs> if I can. You mentioned it before that uh, there are no uh, job opportunities, not enough job opportunities for women. And here in Greece, for instance, uh, there is no equal treatment at theater work between men and women. Do you think that there is a lot of work that has to be done on behalf of women? I think we're in a, there's a huge problem post the pandemic. I think that, um, women uh, have suffered greatly, um, perhaps disproportionately um, in the workplace, not just in the theater, but in the workplace as a result of the pandemic, economically having to hold the fort domestically perhaps. Um, and I think that money is now very short in the arts mm -hmm. And the natural um, tendency is to program conservatively um, because you, you're frightened of failure in your theater. So what do you do? You program a tried and tested play, which will almost certainly have been written by a man um, because those what we call war horses that you know will automatically sell tickets. So this is not a good moment for uh, female writers. And, you know, often those plays, those tried and tested plays of the repertoire will feature more male characters because they come from another era. So we have to 
double down on our efforts to make work for women now. Mm. And, I mean, a critical issue, which I don't know whether this is the same here, but in the UK, is childcare. I mean, why we, we have not organized ourselves um, to help women in the arts um, both have families and work in the theater, I don't know, but we still haven't addressed it. And that's, that's another conversation. Uh, I bet it's obvious to you and to many of us, but um, do you think that, what are the advantages that make a woman more suitable for the theater work, for being a director? I mean, it's so hard to generalize, isn't it? and I have to be careful here, but I think that we, we make community well. You know, we, 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 defer, we default perhaps to community rather than competition. Mm -hmm. um, and theater is about community and making it. And we feel, we, I speak for myself, I enjoy it more than I do, you know, getting out my sword or my gun and, you know, challenging the next person to a duel. I, I just feel we need to reach out to each other. So that, that makes us um, well suited to making work in a rehearsal room, I think. Uh, since you have been involved with Shakespeare um, tragedies and since you are in Athens, the birthplace of tragedies, um, are you interested in uh, involved uh, with an ancient Greek drama? I mean, I'm, I've never recovered from the first performance I saw at Epidavros in, in the big theater. I mean, I will never, ever forget it. Um, it was actually, I can't say it in Greek, but the wasps. Mm -hmm. And when the, I'm going to say the chief wasp came onto the stage and whispered to the audience, I just, I, I'm, yes, I'm, I think we all um, think of theater as having begun here. It's a complete privilege to be here. I've directed very little Greek tragedy. Um, but I'm very, uh, I admire it so much and yeah, I hope to, I'd like to get out to Epidavros if I can. <laughs> After all, there are... Can I come and see the tech, Katerina? <laughs> you might not be ready, but I'll be very quiet at the back. After all, there are a lot of women roles in, women, in uh, Greek tragedies, so... Uh, there is a big range of, uh, of choices. Uh, finally, before uh, our audience uh, could make some questions, I would like to ask if there are other um, te texts with uh, political aspects that came to your attention lately. Well, I mean, I'm afraid it's like, <laughs> I'm sure other directors in the room will, will empathize with this, but when you're, I'm, about to head into probably the most political piece of theater I've ever done, which is um, fraught with uh, controversy before we've even begun rehearsal. Um, but a really, it's very hard to see beyond that. It, it's, that is the world for me at the moment, so I'm not really thinking about, I'm afraid, the, ne the next political play, but there will be one behind the one that's right in front. <laughs> Okay, perfect. So, uh, we're waiting for your contribution and participation to this conversation. Are there any questions? The lady over there. In, in, in Greek tragedy, actually, the men play the women, right? So, how do you see that? I mean, is it something that it, it was normal, it was usual. So in this sense, what you're doing now, you're simply reversing something that was already there. And we have a great example of that. So how would be your take in say directing men again in women roles? That would be interesting as well. Yes, I think that we're, 
we're hopefully moving to a place where we'll be able to cast plays just according to people's human qualities. I think that's the next phase where you won't actually, when you're auditioning, you will just invite whoever feels they're most suitable for the character. It's like Harriet saying she felt she's more suitable for casting for Brutus than Cleopatra because she's just looking at it as on a human level. So I think that is the next phase, which I would welcome. Hi, Felita. Um, this is not related to theatre, this is film. Um, Mamma Mia and Iron Lady were such fantastic films. Um, how did you find working with Meryl Streep? Um, uh, well, it's like being given, I guess if you were a you know, motorbike enthusiast or you rode horses, it's like being given the opportunity to ride you know, the greatest horse you've ever ridden or the whatever. Um, because Meryl can do anything and wants to do anything. She absolutely loves acting. So um, she will offer you 14 ways to play a scene and then say, what, now what would you like? And you can sort of say, well, I'd like number three, but with a bit more of number seven, and then halfway through the scene, can you go to number number 11 and she's like yes because she wants to be able to deliver that she wants to be in conversation and and be able to prove to you that she can do it and there are all kinds of wonders about the way in which she helps talking of how you make work being as transformative as the work you make that having her on a film set um when the most junior runner will go to her trailer and say, um, Meryl, they're ready for you on the studio floor. And it wouldn't matter, you know, who she's on the telephone to, um, whether it be the President of the United States, she would simply say, uh, would you excuse me, I must go put the phone down and literally walk to the studio floor immediately. And so everybody else in that ecosystem is in the same has to be, of course, in the same uh, play by the same ethics. So I suppose what I'm saying is she's so intuitively mindful of the ecology that she's part of that she can see how to help you make it work. And I was greatly supported um, by her, uh, very greatly supported by her on Mamma Mia because I was definitely a rookie. And, um, yeah, having her just... Um, yeah, it was very helpful. Uh, both of these smashing movie hits followed, uh, I mean, Shakespeare trilogy followed these two smashing hits. D did you want to, um, you know, escape from the <laughs> Hollywood industry and uh, go back to a more familiar field? I mean, I'm sure Julie would empathize with this, but it... <sighs> I just think doing certainly a sort of Hollywood movie is, is sort of a bit life-threatening, I found. And I think you just need to do something a little more, uh, come down to earth. Um, and there's just something about being in a room with a small group of actors and have it, the freedom of that um, and not all the pressure of the outlying vested interests so yes i would always go back to the theater for the sheer f the freedom of it actually um however thrilling um being making a movie is yeah as a child you attended uh, an art-based school where as you said uh, i'm quoting your words uh, you lived and breathed theater do you still do that i mean <laughs> uh, is theater still uh, a, a great part of your uh, lifetime? It is actually. I mean, I'm, again, like a lot of theater makers. Actually, you know, during the pandemic, though there were so many 
traumas and losses, there was something great about having, uh, I mean, having a break from it and being able to actually think about what it meant and the gathering sense of loss of it um, was, was really, really profound. But I am now back full swing. I can't help myself going to the theater a lot and, you know, being like lots of theater makers, very angry, very frustrated, um, but still hoping, you know, full of faith, full of faith. And I've, I've go to a lot more local theater than I used to, which is a real privilege. Um, local new writing theaters that are really um, writing about the, the streets and the community that we're living in. Um, that is a new thing for me. In London, we used to always, you know, you used to have to always go up the West End or go to the South Bank to the theater. But there's something, again, the pandemic has intensified that sense of the importance of local community for me. And the theater is very much um, a critical part of that. Thank you very much. Um, holding a, a mirror up to life as you do in the best traditions of, of theater and giving a voice to the unheard and the mute of which I certainly, and I'm sure most of us here in this room are huge admirers of in, um, in your work. Would you ever in that spirit consider giving a voice to the unheard people of say, uh, Donald Trump voters or people who voted Brexit, just to demagoguery aside, which of course plays its part, also try and communicate the woes and worries of those people who voted the things which we perhaps in this room might not agree with, and by, do and by so doing, bring us closer to one another. Do you mean specifically those, those demographics, or do you mean generally putting both sides of an argument. Where giving a voice to the unheard would include, in the words of Hillary Clinton, the deplorables, just to understand why. I mean, I, I don't think I'm the best person. I think that's Julie. <laughs> uh, yeah, I was going to say, I don't, I don't feel the, the, without getting into a political a debate, but I don't feel um, the Republican voice goes unheard in the US, does it? There have been some really interesting new plays that are coming from that perspective and talking about it. That doesn't mean that those, the people who it's about are coming to the theater. That's the difference. <laughs> you know, they may not even care if they're story is told in the theater ex as such. Uh, just, just to clarify from an audience point of view, I just want to understand why people feel compelled to act in certain ways. And, uh, and I, when going to the theater, you want to really understand just the, the tragedies at best as to why people end up doing such, such things which end with, which have such sort of consequential results. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, if, Brexit, I'm obviously a bit more of an expert on than the Republican Party, but I feel that most of us in the UK, those of us who voted to remain, it hasn't created, you know, a, 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 a mighty social schism between us and those who voted to leave. I'm sure in most families, um, you could find that divide. And, and we're all still speaking to each other. And, and so I feel like there's, of course we want to understand what, what how we, what our, what our part was in, in allowing this to happen. I think we all feel responsible rather than just angry. So I feel like, um, you know, why you choose Shakespeare to do is because that both sides of the argument are made. And I think a play that just is proselytizing so extremely that you can't understand all, all facets of it, and that's what's so incredible about, you know, fifth century um, pieces in discussions of, you know, justice. And, um, yeah, I, I, 
So I, I, I think you will hear those stories. I think they are being done. Hi. Uh, firstly, thank you very much for this inspirational talk. Uh, I used to live in the UK and I've experienced Brexit, so I'm really happy that you touched upon <laughs> this issue. Uh, I was particularly excited about the fact that you, you had Spanish and Greek actors in your uh, group, and which is something that you don't, I don't know, you don't come across very much to have like a mixed, uh, you know, group of uh, actors. So I was, it, that made me think, how would the plays that you make sit with a non-English audience? Because all of them have traveled from the UK to America, which is English speaking uh, people. And I was wondering if they have ever been uh, presented in non-English speaking audiences and how would that, mm. you know? They haven't been and I think they should be. So that's the next yeah. mission. <laughs> it would be very interesting to see yeah. how they, what the impact would be. Yeah. yeah, and to find a way of making them intelligible I mean there are all kinds of ways I mean I'm thank you for translating those of you who who I was miraculous that you're live translating thank you hello thank you very much for your presentation. I was just wondering, you talked about this idea level of uh, being just human, just as Judith said. Uh, why do you deny to go to that level through a male part? You seem like you want always, from what I've seen, to start from a female parts that play male parts and, to arrive, and the ideal is the ones that arrive to that level that give a performance of a human. Uh, how do you feel that you cross out the chance of a male to arrive to a level like this, playing female parts and because this is the goal, isn't it? Yeah, well, as I say, I think that's the next phase. I think this is, you know, this is a phase, and obviously, my expertise is um, women. But that's not to say that I couldn't. I, I, I'm, I'm, I completely agree with you. I think that um, it's just that men have had so many more chances to try this. So we're just giving voice to those who have never tried it. It's never been done. Certainly in the UK, men have been trying this for hundreds of years. And it's passed down from family to family and acting dynasties. And so it's, we're trying to rebalance the imbalance. And then when we've done that, then we can all just enter this sweet human space. Hello, and thank you very much for your speech. Hearing you um, uh, saying about your rehearsals, uh, the procedure, um, it uh, came to my mind that it's a, a democratic procedure because you said that each one of the uh, actresses brings their own culture to the rehearsals, and it's uh, like a, a, pro a democratic procedure. Yet there was a critic that uh, called you a tyrannic director. So how come... How would you comment that? I think I cut one of his favorite scenes. <laughs> <laughs> and that, that's he said that. Um, yeah. Yeah. And, then, and, another, <laughs> and another question, please. And um, you said before that uh, you described the, uh, being among women and all the you're working with women. Uh, for me, her, uh, sounded like an idea, uh, ideal, uh, ideal um, circumstance. But uh, are there, of course, there are disadvantages 
by working only with women uh, and female uh, actor, actresses or uh, crew. Could you please uh, send, uh, tell us... Say what the disadvantages yes. are. Yes, yes. No one to do the very heavy lifting, you mean? <laughs> um, we just had to have two of us on the end of each piece of equipment as opposed to one. No, um, I think, you know, it wasn't an experience without complexity. We were a really complicated crew. And indeed, when we first went to America, two people never came back. I mean, and then they joined us back again later. They stayed in the... Uh, so we were like a kind of evolving group of people. New people joined. There were... Half of us remained a fixture all the way through it. But it was, it was complex and, and definitely not a utopia. Um, it was full of, you know, fragility and... Um, uh, you know, of imperfection, full of imperfection, full of failure. I mean, there was lots of failure. Um, so I'm not, I'm not idealizing it at all. And we love working with men. And a lot of us had men to go home to and, <laughs> and talk about what, you know, what traumas we'd been through in the day. So men were always part of our world. And actually, one of the most moving things was the way some of our great actors um, in the UK, some of you will know, like um, Sir Ian McKellen and Brian Cox, who, who plays the lead in Succession, if you've seen Succession. Brian and Ian had both, you know, famously played these parts um, these, these Roman, you know, they played Brutus, and I think Brian had played Brutus at least twice, if not three times. And they were among our greatest supporters and champions. And they, so we felt very, we weren't like a kind of, you know, that we were siloed on an island. We were very much part of the theatre community, and, and that was a wonderful feeling. Men were very generous about what we were doing. Hi, uh, is it easy to find uh, funds for your community work and uh, uh, did uh, Hollywood help or open doors to that? And uh, we don't know if uh, there is any state help of, uh, from, for this community work in England or from uh, the National Theatre or something like that. Well, I, I was trying to say at the beginning that um, there's just... There's just not enough money for all of it um, so that our state funding is shrinking and more money has to come from the private sector, from philanthropy, um, especially for this kind of work. But the point I made um, was that sometimes, I'm not saying it's easy, but sometimes it can help when you're raising money to have a social mission to have a community dimension to what you're doing. Um, it somehow can bring different partners to the table, to the conversation. Um, so, no, there's never enough money for any of it. But, I mean, my main passion is to try to keep, as I said, learning, education, community at the center of things. And... If I were running a theatre, I would have my education, my head of education, like right next to me. I mean, I think that we're not... We have a terrible situation in the UK where art, there's not enough arts in schools. Children don't go to the theatre. And that's where we need investment. It has to start in school. <laughs> 